In the previous lecture's overview of the history of ethnographic film, one of the through lines included a discussion of the relationship between observation, anthropological knowledge, and the question of the aesthetic. In this lecture, we will further explore the interconnections between these terms and what has come to be called the sensory term. Focusing on the Harvard-based Sensory Ethnography Lab and its 2012 film Leviathan, we will also consider the increasing entanglements of ethnographic film with both documentary media more generally, as well as its overlap with formal and aesthetic concerns historically associated with avant-garde and experimental film. In this slide, before we begin, I want to ask us to keep in mind throughout the lecture a question. What does the phrase cinema of exploration mean? I will suggest two possible answers for now. First, cinema of exploration could refer to the exploration of the world and the encounter with other environments, life forms, and cultures. Second, it could mean the exploration of the forms and techniques of the cinema itself, a forensic investigation into its materials and methods of representation and evocation. As I hope this lecture will bear out, these two meanings are not, of course, mutually exclusive. According to the uh, Sensory Ethnography Lab website, quote, the Sensory Ethnography Lab, or SEL, is an experimental laboratory that promotes innovative combinations of aesthetics and ethnography. It uses analog and digital media, installation, and performance to explore the aesthetics and ontology of the natural and unnatural world. Harnessing perspectives drawn from the arts, the social and natural sciences, and the humanities, the SEL encourages attention to the many dimensions of the world, both animate and inanimate, that may, only with difficulty, if at all, be rendered with words. In addition to being the director uh, of the SEL, Lucian Casting Taylor was previously the editor of the Visual Anthropology Review in the early 1990s, and he's made a number of key contributions to the development of sensory ethnography, an emergent subfield of anthropology which questions many of its assumptions and disciplinary boundaries, as well as brings together a variety of concerns with the body, experience, affect, aesthetics, and phenomenology. Casting Taylor is the author and editor of at least four important scholarly texts heralding and, and theorizing the sensory term, including a critical meditation on ethnographic film entitled Iconophobia, published in 1966, where he argues in favor of, quote, the lyricism of lived experience, unquote, captured by cinema's exper experientially dense moving images. In his co-authored introduction to an edited collection on filmmaker Robert Gardner, Casting Taylor further posits that the increasing turn to the visual and the cinematic represents, quote, an effort to elaborate a fundamentally post-semiotic anthropology that foregrounds the phenomenological priority of embodiment in our apprehension of the world as the existential condition of possibility of both self and culture. While Casting Taylor is seeking a way out of the linguistic overdetermination of the ethnographic encounter, to reorient and re-embody experience and knowledge as more than effects of language and ideology, he also does this at the cost, perhaps, of social and historical contextualization. The sensory approach risks not only reinstating certain cultural and social essentialisms that might themselves be questioned by a more critically distanced methodology or technique, but it can also leave unexamined and obscure its own appeals to immediacy, the body, subjectivity, touch, and so on, all existentially and phenomenologically important ways to explore the world and to ground knowledge, to be sure, but cultural and social, indeed political notions too, that can be made to serve different logics of power and ideological ends. Nevertheless, the SEL's ambitious mandate is devoted to producing a kind of ethnographic film that is materialist and phenomenological, one that burrows into experience. This turn towards sensual and structural ontology that embraces an aggressive observational mode as its primary aesthetic is indicative of a more general shift from the deconstructive textuality of postmodern ethnography found in works like Trinity Minha's Reassemblage. And indeed, it openly champions the aesthetic as such, not as a term to be repressed and derided, 
but actively cultivated as a crucial dimension of existence. In his series of interviews with Scott MacDonald, Casting Taylor emphasizes the influence of American pragmatist philosopher John Dewey on his approach. In Art as Experience, Dewey develops what is essentially a phenomenology of art that grounds it in the rich materiality and expressiveness of everyday life. Here is a sample from Dewey. In order to understand the aesthetic in its ultimate and approved forms, one must begin with it in the raw, in the events and scenes that hold the attentive eye and ear of man, arousing his interest and affording him enjoyment as he looks and listens. The sights that hold the crowd, the fire engine rushing by, the machines excavating enormous holes in the earth, the human fly climbing the steeple side, the men perched high in air on girders, throwing and catching red-hot bolts. The sources of art in human experience will be learned by him who sees how the tense grace of the ball player infects the onlooking crowd, who notes the delight of the housewife in tending her plants, and the intent interest of her goodman in tending the patch of green in front of the house, the zest of the spectator in poking the wood burning on the hearth, and in watching the darting flames and crumbling coals. These people, if questioned as to the reason for their actions, would doubtless return reasonable answers. The man who poked the sticks of burning wood would say he did it to make the fire burn better, but he is nonetheless fascinated by the colorful drama of change enacted before his eyes and imaginatively partakes in it. He does not remain a cold spectator. So what we see in Dewey's evocative prose here, his description, his sort of phenomenological description, is an investment in uh, the aspects of everyday life that are not simply about representations, but are about uh, these the, the meeting points, the gatherings uh, between different things, uh, between different forms that elicit and that provoke, that call forth responses and activities. So things that become um, collective. So these things that are also have uh, reciprocities and that uh, share in their materiality, that share in their shapes and their processes, and therefore form combinations. So we have shared materials and shared forms. There is also a sense, I think, in this Dewey quote of something uh, that is different from the idea of the world as merely information or as something abstract. There is a sense of the distinct, the singular, the embodied action. So we could see, for example, how a person pouring tea uh, f to take one uh, instance, is at once a cultural or gestural practice that is repeatable and that is culturally specific and produces information and meaning, but we can also understand how this gesture of pouring tea uh, is a unique existential event. And the cinema, uh, casting Taylor, I think would argue, can capture the sound and the image and perhaps even the feeling of a specific action such as pouring tea. And in this way, the action, the distinct specific act, the single time that one does it, becomes valuable uh, in itself and not simply as, a, as, a, as an instance of a larger uh, action uh, such as uh, the cultural form of pour, pouring tea, you might say. The sensory turn in ethnographic film places greater value on other dimensions of experience and perception, such as sound and touch, in an overall effort then to move away from abstractions and ready-made categories of knowledge. To this end, recent ethnographic films made at the SEL deploy new audiovisual technologies and aesthetic strategies to locate meaning as an embodied experience. Released to wide acclaim in 2012, the SEL production Leviathan can be considered a key film in sensory ethnography. In a number of interviews, Castaigne Taylor and Marina Paravel, the co-makers of the film, have made explicit their desire to not subordinate the film and its images, the experiences and the sensations they conjure, to language and pre-established models of knowledge, that is, to the logos. As Casting Taylor puts it, quote, we are not trying to say anything. Films, like everything humans make, are about something in some way. But to imagine that they are about something that could be expressed in words outside of the fabric of the film itself is kind of ludicrous, because then you wouldn't make the film, you would write it. Indeed, for Casting Taylor, 
cinema provides a certain escape from the tyranny of a linguistic model of understanding culture. As he once wrote, quote, What makes film so captivating is that it is something other or more than just language. Indeed, given the apparent affinity of film with life itself, moving images evoking moving life, hearing evoking hearing, and seeing seeing, given the centrality of the life world to anthropology, given the exemplary open-endedness of ethnography, whose wealth of detail is always supposed to transcend the theoretical services to which it may be put, and given the attention anthropologists have devoted lately to representations of the body and to the embodiment of experience, the backlash against film, no less than the ongoing desire to linguify it, seems all the more unlikely. Shifting from our discussion of theory to the film itself, it is worthwhile to point out some of the film Leviathan's cinematic forebears. These films can serve as intertexts and reference points in our apprehension and appreciation of the film. In terms of theme, one of the main precedents for Leviathan is Drifters, John Gerson's 1929 documentary about labor aboard a fishing trawler. And in terms of form, one has to take into account the metaphysically oriented and aesthetically powerful films of Robert Gardner notably his 1986 Forest of Bliss. In the broadest of terms, both drifters and Forest of Bliss center around water and the human activity that takes place around and upon it. This human activity, moreover, is shown in both films to be intimately connected to other forms of animal life in an ecological web of interconnected relations. But perhaps the key thematic and aesthetic precedents for Leviathan are the previous films of the filmmakers themselves, such as Casting Taylor's 2009 Sweetgrass, made with his partner Elisa Barbash, and anthropologist Farina Pravel and filmmaker J.P. Snydecki's 2010 Foreign Parts, both films experiments in a kind of modernist salvage ethnography. Sweetgrass meditates on the twilight of cowboys and a mythically American sheep drive across the mount mountains of Montana. Foreign Parts, constructing a post-observational ethnographic portrait of a soon-to-be-scattered outsider community of people who live amongst auto scraps and recycling shops in a junkyard in Queens, New York. These works, as well as Leviathan, also anticipate later casting Taylor and Parvell uh, experiments conducted under the auspices of the SEL, such as 2017's Sam Niliqui, which the Documenta Festival catalog describes in the following way. In Somniloquies, dream talker Dion McGregor's nightly musings are coupled with images of sleeping nudes, a roving camera that moves indiscernibly from one contour and orifice to another, one body to another, one gender to another, one ethnicity to another, one animal to another. And Caniba, also released in 2017, which the Venice Biennale describes as a film, quote, that reflects on the discomfitting significance of cannibalistic desire in human existence through the prism of one Japanese man, Issei Sagawa, and his mysterious relationship with his brother. Like Leviathan, these two films press themselves into their subjects with extreme close-ups, generating at times suffocating and at times alienating yet viscerally intimate sensations. Objects and subjects in these films often become opaque, blurred, fuzzy, as if touched by and themselves touching the camera eye. Fundamental to this aesthetic, indeed this erotic strategy, is a negation or escape from representational distance and the meanings that emerge therefrom. These films seem to hold knowledge in classical ethnographic form in a state of suspension, and connected to the suspension of knowledge, they withhold judgment as well. Leviathan was shot in 2010 to 2011 off the coast of New Bedford, Massachusetts, the fabled setting of Herman Melville's 19th century sea story, Moby Dick. The novel serves as a kind of intertext for the film, informing it with mythical resonances and undertones. Indeed, as they have stated in numerous interviews, the filmmakers took to reading passages of the book to each other in downtime from shooting, that is, when they were not heaving over the side of the boat or barely sleeping. One of the most obvious and notable features of Leviathan belongs to its mode or technical method of production, 
shot with a battery of small digital video cameras, some 14 GoPro Hero sports cameras, the filmmakers delegated the labor and creativity of shooting to a variety of actors involved in the film event. Attaching the cameras directly to the fishermen's bodies, heads, and limbs, as well as to various places on the ship and on poles that could be dunked into the water, the filmmakers willingly divested themselves of their authority and agency in producing many of the images. In this respect, practicing a kind of shared anthropology. Following in the footsteps of Rusch's notion of shared anthropology, Leviathan then might be seen as sharing or decentering and redistributing its authority with the ship, the animals, and indeed the environment itself. According to the filmmakers, this shared anthropology or collective encounter was paradoxically intended to disturb and redistribute authorship to generate images that broke with conventions of Renaissance space and to, quote, create a multiplicity of perspectives that would relativize the human perspectives uh, and make the spectator rethink humanity's relationship to nature in relationship to a plethora of other beings, of other animals, of other kinds of animate and inanimate objects, the elements, the earth, the sky, the sea, the boat, mechanization, fish, crustaceans, starfish, everything that is involved in the ecology of what's going on in industrial fishing today." Unquote. On this level, prior to editing and sound mixing, the film is in a sense less authorized by the filmmakers, and indeed strangely hypermediated by the chaotic forces of the various bodies and forces in and surrounding the ecology of the ship, thus bringing the ethnographic desire to discover and record together with both the intensely intimate and the alien. In this way, the composite creature that is Leviathan, so Casting Taylor and Paravel argue, brings us closer to the visceral and the affective, that is, pre-linguistic experience of industrial fishing, at the same time that it displaces the human subject as center of attention, interest, and meaning. Again, the filmmakers turn to a notion of the cosmic to explain. Quote, in Leviathan, we were after a representation of humanity that feels to us ultimately more humble because it's decontextualized in a wider environmental and cosmic way, one that tests between the intimately anthropocentric and the uncannily extraterrestrial." Unquote. In the watery depths that Leviathan explores through the technological conditions of the GoPro cameras, the human subject as historical actor, whether ethnographic filmmaker or fisherman come photographer or film viewer, is subsumed into a much grander scheme that swallows up history, culture, politics, and perhaps even language itself. In this way, Leviathan openly embraces the sensory aesthetic in its carnal and its cosmic vision of life at sea, of sea life. And in these and aspects uh, can be found some of the ways to differentiate Leviathan from other recent nonfiction films about the environment, ecology, industrial fishing, or the food industry, such as 2008's Food, Inc., or the melodramatic reality television show, The Deadliest Catch, which can be heard in the ship's cabin in Leviathan. To conclude, I turn to a film from outside anthropology and ethnographic film that can help further elucidate the aesthetic stakes of Leviathan. Avant-garde filmmaker Michael Snow's 1971 La Région Centrale is a three-hour experiment in perception in which a remotely operated and disembodied camera virtuosically and uncannily pans, scans, and tilts on its axis to provide myriad angles and disorientations from which to view a des desolate northern landscape. Let us consider Snow's computer-assisted camera operations and the wide array of unsettling points of view, as well as the technical constraints that help condition them in La Region Centrale alongside those of Leviathan. This is a clip from La Region Centrale.
In his Iconophobia essay, Casting Taylor refers to the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard's argument that, quote, the ambiguity and opacity of the perceptual medium will always upset orders of prosaic textual representation with their yearning for clarity and lucidity, end quote. What Lyotard once wrote of La Région Centrale's ambiguous and commentary-free stare at the landscape, then, might indeed hold for Leviathan as well. As Lyotard observes in his essay, The Unconscious as Mise-en-Scène, quote, we should use these works to set up perspectives of realities with an eye on enjoying heretofore unexperienced intensities. The machines which are drawn into play are, essentially, no longer the machines of illusion and memory, but apparati for experimentation which permit us to quarter sensibility and draw it out beyond this old body." Unquote. We can see in the aesthetic operations of Leviathan, perhaps something similar to that Lyotard observes in La Région Centrale, an animating tension between that of seemingly total or immersive coverage embodied by the new mobility of the camera and so on that escapes from the old body of traditional humanism and representation on the one hand, and a generalized obscurity and opacity, if not evasion, of meaning on the other. It is for these reasons that Perivel describes the experience of making Leviathan, as well as the finished film, as something, quote, bloody and dark and strange, unquote, evoking the tropes of science fiction and horror, as well as the avant-garde film, alongside more conventional ethnographic qualities. In this way, Leviathan foregoes the conventional ethnographic film's investment in empirically and didactically grounded representational forms, such as voiceover, interview, subtitles, etc., alongside standards of framing and narrative or argumentative shot construction, in order to get closer to, as it were, the things themselves, which is to say, the chaotic movements, routine labor, animal destruction and interaction, the web of life established between all of these and the practice of image making itself at once representational and abstract, in a word, figural, as the filmmakers put it. Effectively, for Castaigne, Taylor, and Paravel, the cinematic vision machine can help the human being to escape from the confines of the text to the expansive terrain of the body and the dwelling space of the animal. In Leviathan, then, the sensory turn designates something more than mere art history, intertextual illusion, cultivated taste, or the production of cultural meaning or scientific knowledge. For casting Taylor and Paravel, the sensory turn names an aesthetic mode that seems, at once, to return to and to explode the original desire of the ethnographic film, going all the way back to Félix Louis Reignon, in terms of seeking to know and to experience the world through the visual, the embodied, and the gestural. It also names a desire that we could describe as the human passion to escape ourselves, that is, to rediscover our animality, to cinematically undergo our own bestialization. I am reminded here, finally, of Senegalese filmmaker Ousmane Semben's famous criticism of Jean Rouche and his, in his effort to develop a shared anthropology with his cine eye ear. Sembin observed that for all his apparently humanist intentions, Rouche nevertheless looked at the African people as if they were insects. We might say something similar about the way Leviathan views its subjects. Casting Taylor and Paravel, however, would take this as confirmation that they are in fact doing something right. Thank you.